The present is the only thing that has no end. If all this damned quantum jumping were really here to stay, I should be sorry. I should be sorry I ever got involved with quantum theory. If one has left this entire system to itself for an hour, one would say that the cat still lives if meanwhile no atom has decayed. The psi function of the entire system would express this by having in it the living and dead cat, pardon the expression, mixed or smeared out in equal parts. Vedanta teaches that consciousness is singular. All happenings are played out in one universal consciousness and there is no multiplicity of selves. We must not wait for things to come, believing that they are decided by irrescindable destiny. If we want it, we must do something about it. The scientist only imposes two things namely truth and sincerity, imposes them upon himself and upon other scientists. What we observe as material bodies and forces are nothing but shapes and variations in the structure of space. I insist upon the view that all is waves. I am very astonished that the scientific picture of the real world around me is deficient. It gives a lot of factual information, puts all our experience in a magnificently consistent order but it is ghastly silent about all and sundry that is really near to our heart, that really matters to us. It cannot tell us a word about red and blue, bitter and sweet, physical pain and physical delight. It knows nothing of beautiful and ugly, good or bad, God and eternity. Quantum physics thus reveals a basic oneness of the universe. For eternally and always there is only now, one and the same now, the present is the only thing that has no end. No self is of itself alone. If a man never contradicts himself, the reason must be that he virtually never says anything at all. Consciousness is a singular for which there is no plural. There is no kind of framework within which we find consciousness in the plural. This is simply something we construct because of the temporal plurality of individuals, but it is a false construction. The only solution to this conflict, insofar as any is available to us at all, lies in the ancient wisdom of the Upanishad. The world is a construct of our sensations, perceptions, memories. It is convenient to regard it as existing objectively on its own, but it certainly does not become manifest by its mere existence. Nature has no reverence towards life. Nature treats life as though it were the most valueless thing in the world. Nature does not act by purposes.
if we were bees, ants, or Lacedaemonian warriors, to whom personal fear did not exist and cowardice is the most shameful thing in the world, warring would go on forever. But luckily, we are only men and cowards. I know not whence I came, nor whither I go, nor who I am. This life of yours which you are living is not merely a piece of this entire existence, but in a certain sense the whole. Only this whole is not so constituted that it can be surveyed in one single glance. This, as we know, is what the Brahmins express in that sacred, mystic formula, which is yet really so simple and so clear. Tat Tuam Asi, this is you. Or again, in such words as, I am in the east and the west. I am above and below. I am this entire world. If you cannot, in the long run, tell everyone what you have been doing, your doing has been worthless. I consider it extremely doubtful whether the happiness of the human race has been enhanced by the technical and industrial developments that followed in the wake of rapidly progressing natural science. In Darwin's theory, you just have to substitute mutations for his slight accidental variations, just as quantum theory substitutes quantum jump for continuous transfer of energy. In all other aspects, little change was necessary in Darwin's theory. We do not belong to this material world that science constructs for us. We are not in it. We are outside. We are only spectators. The reason why we believe that we are in it, that we belong to the picture, is that our bodies are in the picture. Our bodies belong to it. Not only my own body, but those of my friends, also of my dog and cat and horse, and of all the other people and animals. And this is my only means of communicating with them. Consciousness cannot be accounted for in physical terms, for consciousness is absolutely fundamental. It cannot be accounted for in terms of anything else. Whence I came, whither go I? Science cannot tell us a word about why music delights us, of why and how an old song can move us to tears. Science is reticent too when it is a question of the great unity the one of Parmenides, of which we all somehow form part, to which we belong. The most popular name for it in our time is God, with a capital G. Whence come I and whither go I? That is the great unfathomable question, the same for every one of us. Science has no answer to it. Every man's world picture is and always remains a construct of his mind and cannot be proved to have any other existence. It seems plain and self-evident, yet it needs to be said. 
the isolated knowledge obtained by a group of specialists in a narrow field has in itself no value whatsoever, but only in its synthesis, with all the rest of knowledge and only in as much as it really contributes in this synthesis toward answering the demand, who are we? Briefly summarizing, we can express the proposed law thus. Consciousness is bound up with learning in organic substance. Organic competence is unconscious. Still more briefly, and put in a form which is admittedly rather obscure and open to misunderstanding, becoming is conscious, being unconscious. Our perceiving self is nowhere to be found in the world picture, because it itself is the world picture. We are thus faced with the following question. Why should an organ like our brain, with the sensorial system attached to it, of necessity consist of an enormous number of atoms, in order that its physically changing state should be in close and intimate correspondence with a highly developed thought. The non-physicist finds it hard to believe that really the ordinary laws of physics which he regards as the prototype of inviolable precision, should be based on the statistical tendency of matter to go over into disorder. Knowledge, feeling and choice are essentially eternal and unchangeable and numerically one in all men, nay, in all sensitive beings. The total number of minds in the universe is one 